Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. Let me share my screen. Um, can you see it now? Yep. Oops. Not this way. Uh, presentation. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, the concept construction for spinning uh, compact objects. And uh, so basically, <clears throat> um, this uh, specific model for spinning or compact objects was first derived uh, in 2014 <clears throat> by De La Couture. And then Andy Kampenko added some additional um, corrections. And basically, Amanda and me uh, added some other and then implemented numerically. So uh, previously, uh, last year, December, I gave a talk on the numeric implementation. And today, I will go in detail to uh, the um, theoretical derivation of this particular model that I find very interesting. And so this is the overview. I'm gonna, as, as I can see that there are a couple of people uh, that work in related area, in, in non-related areas. I'm gonna try to introduce as much as I can all the um, <clears throat> necessary concepts um, such as uh, symmetries. We're gonna work uh, with the scalar toy model. Uh, we're gonna show what, how uh, symmetries are spontaneously broken. And then I'm gonna introduce what the concept construction is, which is a very powerful tool for um, building up uh, effective action. And then uh, we're gonna briefly uh, construct, uh, we're gonna uh, briefly see how we can derive a theory of gravity. Uh, in particularly, it's gonna be like Einstein's Birvine field theory. Then um, we're gonna derive extended objects and then spinning extended objects uh, and some corrections. And at the end, I'm gonna discuss some interesting points uh, uh, compared to some other theories, uh, previously uh, derived theories. So, okay. Um, so why effective field series? Well, um, we use effective field theory because um, when we have different phenomena, we don't need to understand like what is happening at all scales. We just need to understand that very specific scale. So basically nature decoupled uh, short distance physics from a large distance physics. And so effective field theory uh, are the theoretical tools we work uh, with this hierarchy and the coupling scale. And so as we will see, this framework allows us to simplify the description of different systems. So for the introduction of effective field theory, I will follow uh, some part of the book of Burgess, Introduction to Effective Field Theories, and uh, for instance, the, the scalar to model. And for uh, the concept construction, I will follow uh, lecture notes from Penko, Introduction to Effective Field Theories. Also. So let's start with symmetries. Um, so a symmetry in field theory is usually defined in terms of local transformations um, that leave the action environment. <clears throat> um, when we consider, well, within this talk, we are gonna consider just symmetries that can be um, parametrized by a continuous parameter such as equation nine. Um, so you, um, from just just as the exponential factor of some um, of the continuous the parameter times some Q emission operator if uh, U is unitary. And so we have two types of symmetries, global symmetries, that is that theta is not dependent on space time position. And then we have the case, <clears throat> well, this is global symmetries. And we, then we have the case when theta is uh, dependent on the space time coordinate. Um, and these transformations are usually called local or gauge symmetries. We're gonna talk more about them. Um, and also it's, uh, it's important to recall what the Poincaré group is. It's just uh, the Lorentz transformations plus translations. Uh, and this is denoted at ISO 3,1. Um, 
And so we have some algebra for the group, which is given by the commutator of uh, the generators of translation and Lorentz transformation. So with this in mind, we can proceed. Um, and also there's something important to recall is there are two time of symmetries, internal and space time symmetries. Um, yeah, an internal, an example of internal symmetry is equation five. So you have some transformation of the field in which the uh, position is in change. And then you have an example of a space of symmetry in six in which uh, you actually change the, the coordinates. Uh, and so both symmetries can arise uh, in, in global or gauge varieties. And as we will see later, uh, local space time symmetries uh, lead to different more system invariants in the theory of gravity. So, Okay, let's introduce uh, our scalar term model. So this is very helpful to understand the hierarchy of the coupling and the coupling. Um, in particular, we, we find that uh, uh, there are two types of particle, one much heavier than the other. So we can consider the complex scalar field, uh, equation seven, uh, which, is, which has some connected parts and then some potential, which is given by equation eight and basically this potential has two real positive constants uh, lambda and mu squared and so basically this potential has a sombrero shape and then has some minima uh, at the value of uh, phi equal nu the absolute value of phi equal nu um, so in this toy model, the ground state, the classical uh, ground state is, <clears throat> is uh, defined by the configuration that minimizes the classical energy given by equation nine. And so this is minimized by setting each of the terms to zero, equal to zero. And so basically this uh, will be for the classical ground, ground state will be any configuration such that um, the field doesn't change in time or in space, and such that uh, um, you know the complex scalar field uh, phi, the conjugate times uh, the scalar field, it's uh, equal to nu squared. And in this case, um, as, as in equation eight, that would be that the potential is equal to zero. So that's the ground state, um, and so. We can explore the hierarchy of scale by expanding of, uh, of scalar action uh, of a, a complex uh, scalar um, around classical vacuum. And just, we can redefine just the field as uh, another field, tilde, tilde phi, um, plus, um, from, plus the relevant constant nu. And so by doing the algebra, you obtain equation 10, um, and basically, you can express it in terms of uh, real and imaginary parts, and you end up, well, to leading order, you end up with uh, equation 11. And so if we, <clears throat> well, in this equation, we can see uh, by comparing to equation 12, that is like the action for a complex color field, that uh, now we have uh, two types of particles, phi r, which is a heavy particle. In equation 11, we can see it has a connected term and some mass term with mass lambda nu squared. And then you have some massless particle that has uh, mass equal to zero. So those two are or heavy and, um, and well, like massless states. So, um, okay. So the action we we have the scalar action basically is invariant on the u fa u one phase rotation such that the field uh, transforms with um, is invariant when transforming with some uh, elements that contain uh, yeah some parameters omega and so in terms of the real and imaginary part it's uh, you can see the transformation in equation thirteen uh, so you can see that actually it uh, acts linearly and homogeneously on the field, and we say this is uh, linearly realized. But this transformation is not enough to say that 
some other matter fields will transform, uh, some other matter fields with some momentum P will transform also linearly. So actually we now need to look at the ground state. And so if a symmetry of the action uh, does not leave the ground state invariant, then we say it is spontaneously broken. Um, so in our toy model, um, the ground state, say, had zero, satisfied that the expectation value around of the field around the, the ground state is equal to new. So we can see that this is invariant. So, um, yeah. So in our potential, if new is equal to zero, then the ground state is invariant. If new is different to zero, then we are spontaneously broken, breaking asymmetry. So um, it is easier to to see it if uh, we change our variable. So now we can define the field in terms of two new the 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 five field in terms of two new real fields uh, t and c as equation for t. Uh, and basically, when we transform under this, uh, the transformation of this new field, uh, field under the U1 symmetry have a very simple form, which is equation 15 and 16. And basically, uh, the, he, the heat term is unchanged, and then the C term uh, changes as a, transforms as a homogeneous shift. Uh, this is very important because um, as we, well, so yes, so in equation 16, uh, the, the massless state carries all the burden of the symmetry transformation. And so, well, so the original action in terms of C and uh, he, uh, follows the equation 17 and 18. And so basically we can separate um, the interaction part and the non-interacting part. And so we will find the same answer as before. Uh, we will find in equation 19 that we have two, two um, type of particles, one that is uh, massless and the other one has some mass. And so, what we can learn uh, from these examples is that the symmetry relies on the massless state as an inhomogeneous uh, shift that we call nonlinear realization of the symmetry. And this is going to be a characteristic of a system that spontaneously breaks a symmetry. So, yeah, more about Goldstone bosons. The, so, um, well, actually, let's define it. Um, as we can see, the C term always appears differentiated. Uh, this is a consequence of the symmetry transformation. Uh, and so, as C is a um, is massless term, it will remain massless to all orders in in a small expansion parameter. And so, finally, we define what a Goldstone boson is is the field, uh, the massless uh, scalar field that is warranted to exist for a spontaneously broken symmetry. That, uh, but this is just valid for um, internal symmetries, um, um, global symmetries. Sorry. Um, as we will see later, there's, um, there are some subtleties with local symmetries. And so at this point, we can now, um, I mean, I'm going to talk a bit more about this spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, maybe to clarify a bit more um, on this new concept. Um, so basically, so if we have a ground state uh, that is invariant under asymmetry, then um, the symmetry is continuously broken. If uh, we have this case then of, of, a, of a spontaneously symmetry broken, then another state is produced once a 
and uh, transformation is applied to the ground state. And this new ground state, uh, this new state uh, will have the same energy and it's a candidate for a new ground state. And so, yeah, basically, yes, we have seen in our model where that um, when mu is different to zero, then we are breaking asymmetry. So we can recall Goldstone theorem. Uh, we already like found it in our example, but we we're gonna be more like uh, general. So Goldstone theorem states that if you have a system which with a continuous global symmetry and then if it's spontaneously broken, then you will have a new state. Uh, they notice uh, Nambu, Goldstone, or Goldstone mode. And so this mode must be gapless in the sense that it, uh, its energy vanishes in the limit where the momentum vanishes. And so for a relativistic system, this uh, implies um, the masslessness of the Goldstone particle. So um, something more to say about linear versus nonlinear realizations is, um, well, with our toy, toy model is that, um, okay, so if, if a symmetry isn't broken, then we can uh, act linearly. But if the symmetry is broken, then it cannot be true that we can do that. So actually, like we can take a look to some scales. Um, so in this particular example, we have two scales, W that are of the U, like the scale of the UV physics. And then we have uh, the scale nu uh, that is of the expectation value uh, responsible for the spontaneous symmetry break. So if we have the case nu equals zero or nu much less than W, then fields are realized linearly, whether or greater to W, then symmetries are realized non-linearly. And so as we will see, if uh, the symmetry cannot be realized linearly, then there's an alternative standard realization that is possible for a wide path symmetry breaking pattern. Um, and so a linear symmetry, symmetry simply is a symmetry uh, that in which the field transform uh, as equation 22 is a very simple transformation uh, for some matrices M. Um, and in the case of non-linearly non realized symmetries that we have seen, then uh, we have an inhomogeneous shift. Um, and so basically, basically, I think that's all. Maybe we can just continue. Um, yes. So now it's the concept construction. Uh, until now, there's any like question? Um, well, maybe I will just continue. So uh, you can like uh, you can stop me whenever um, if I if I have any question. So, okay, so I introduced like um, what a spontaneously broken symmetry is with our toy model. And now I'm gonna introduce what the concept construction is. So, um, <clears throat> so if we have fields that transform linearly, then it's easy to build up an invariant action. Otherwise, if they transform non-linearly, non then it's not that straightforward. So the Costell construction is um, a general technique to write down effective actions that are invariant under non-linearly realized symmetries. It's very powerful uh, because to derive the effective action, you only use uh, the symmetry breaking pattern. Um, so what was the full symmetry group G and what is the subgroup H that was realized non-linearly? Um, so with only that information, you can derive, uh, we, you can obtain building blocks and then derive an effective action. So um, let's consider a symmetry group G with Poincaré group as a subgroup. And let's assume that uh, the ground state uh, spontaneously breaks 
uh, to a breakdown to a subgroup. Okay, so just a bit before this. So any any uh, system other than vacuum with uh, break at least uh, some of the symmetry. So uh, in this case, uh, we consider we consider uh, the symmetry breaking pattern such that uh, we have unbroken translations. Then we have uh, well the associated generators are uh, denoted with p as in equation 24, and then we have some other unbroken symmetries with generator t, and then some broken symmetries with generator x. And so x and t will contain some space-time internal uh, generators, and the broken symmetries uh, generated by the x and the unbroken translations are going to be realized non-linearly on the Boltzmann field. And so the cosect of instruction allows us to write down all possible gene invariant combinations of Goldstone and derivatives. So in order to achieve this, uh, we start by a local parameterization of the cassette, G over H naught, where H naught is the broken subgroup of H um, generated by the, 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 the oops. Uh, and so we can parameterize um, the cosette as equation 25. The element G is just the product of two elements containing um, um, basically the generators of uh, the broken symmetry and the broken symmetry. Um, this is uh, the most general group element. And the first factor uh, that contains the, the generator of translations uh, describes a translation from the origin of the coordinate system to some point YA uh, in which pi's are going to be, the Goldstone fields are going to be evaluated. Uh, and basically, this term ensures that uh, the pi's will transform correctly under spatial translation. Um, so there are some transformation properties. And basically, uh, we can uh, study how uh, Goldson field transform under an element F, generic element F of the symmetry G. Um, so like just, uh, yeah, it just transform F on H, or F on G. So we can decompose it um, as in equation 26, uh, this transformation um, as, so this product of elements will look like G, but evaluated at a different point, and then some element H. Um, and H is dependent, is some element of the group, of the subgroup H naught, dependent on the Goldstone field and is dependent on the coordinates. And so, uh, oops. And so this type of transformation rule, uh, well, this F on G defines uh, the transformation rules for the fields that are in generally highly non-linear, but it will define it in a simple way. Um, so, yes. So, from the cosette parameterization, we can build up um, another important quantity called uh, the moderate Cartan form, which is uh, a quantity um, that is an element of the algebra uh, of G, and it has the peculiarity that you can express it as a linear combination of all the generator, uh, that is equation 27. And basically, um, the coefficients that accompany, uh, that are, that comes with the generator are going to be the building blocks of our effective action. Uh, and these building blocks can be computed using the uh, commutation relations of the generators. We will do, well, we will see some explicit computation uh, soon. And so there are different fields the, the, that we have introduced uh, in, in equation 27. We have some uh, coefficients uh, e, some uh, 
cosset derivative of the gold star and some other coefficient uh, of the bro unbroken generator. So the coefficient E um, basically is the virvine, um, which which transforms um, as equation 28 um, on their where H is a matrix representation of the abstract group elements. And so, yeah, the, oops. So basically the coefficients E mu alpha are known as uh, the coset Birvine. And so this is gonna uh, make an integration measure uh, with the determinant of, of the Birvine that transforms like a scalar on their all the symmetries. And so this ensures that um, the cosette can be carried out uh, without using an uh, without using a coordinate system. So it's just it's carried out in an arbitrary coordinate frame. Um, and then we have the cosette derivative. Uh, basically, this can be thought as covariant derivative of the Boson fields, and they transform covariantly on their own symmetries uh, as equation twenty nine. And um, basically, these coset derivatives are very nonlinear as equation theory. Like, so you have some, say, term um, that is proportional to the pi partial derivative of pi, and then some other high, highly nonlinear terms. And as to the coset derivative is very nonlinear. Um, so the fact that it's constructed in this way ensures that it will transform in a very simple way. So if you can see like equation 30 is very highly nonlinear, but the transformation rules of equation 29 are like fairly simple. <clears throat> um, yes. So, and finally we have another building block. So this building block, uh, as we can see in, in equation 31, it transforms uh, as a connection. So it's, it's known as the Cosette connection, and it can be used to define the covariant derivative as equation 32. Um, yes. And so- Owen, is this, the, this the Cosette derivative Leibniz? <clears throat> it's not clear from the second term that you had there that it was. Um, uh, can, can, you, can you repeat the question? Is the Cosette derivative Leibniz? Uh, it doesn't I'm, sorry, product I'm, rule. Not, I'm, I'm not understanding the last word. Is the Does it satisfy the product, the product rule? If, um, sorry, I think I'm not understanding this question very well. Just go forward one slide. Forward here. Yeah. Mm, there, there, okay, mm -hmm. equation 32. Mm. Mm -hmm. What are this? Okay, so they transform as a connection. Okay, okay, never mind. It's fine. It does. Okay, okay, um, okay. So this this covariant derivative can also act uh, on matter fields as long as they transform linearly on their um, the element H. And so, <clears throat> okay. We, we have seen some transformation rules that are fairly simple, but they are highly nonlinear in the Colson field. But this nonlinearity is contained in uh, <clears throat> the building block and the um, element H. Um, yes. So maybe I can keep going forward. Um, so having those building blocks, we can uh, build up uh, like a general action, and we could simply uh, contract in all possible all possible operators uh, that are invariant on their the unbroken transformation. And so, um, yes. So the effective action for the breaking pattern that we have been talking about, G uh, breaks down to H. So it takes the form of equation thirty three. It's, this is very general, uh, but basically it says that having your verbine and the coset derivatives and a covariant derivative 
basically you can build up any invariant Lagrangian, the most general invariant Lagrangian. Um, and yeah, basically that's how we can build up general Lagrangians. We will do it more explicitly. And okay, so we can uh, add gauge symmetries. We can modify the the uh, more Cartan form. So say that we have some subgroup G prime that belongs to like it's in G. Um, and so we have some generators E that are gauged. Um, so we can replace the, the partial derivative with the covariant derivative and then add our gauge fields uh, and generators into the motor carton form. And so this modified or covariant motor carton form can also be decomposed into a linear combination of the generators. And in this case, now the verbine and the set derivative and the other coefficient will now depend on the gauge field. Um, yes. <clears throat> so just one, um, something else to say is that, uh, so as we, as I mentioned earlier, Goldstone's theorem um, basically states that I will mode exists for each broken generator, but this is only for internal symmetries. Um, if we have space and symmetries, then this is not true. Uh, there, there can be a mismatch, but also, so there's uh, some constraints that can be implemented. So this is called uh, inverse Higgs, Higgs constraints. And basically, um, uh, in, the, in the second to last point, um, the condition is like, Whenever, uh, whenever we have to multiply, say x and x tilde, uh, of of the broken generator, and they, and they, I mean, the commutator commutator relation includes these two elements, then basically we can set to zero one of uh, the covariant derivatives, and uh, this implies, or yeah, this implies that the covariant derivative nabla pi equal to zero. Um, so having said that, uh, I have basically introduced all the necessary elements to derive uh, the action for a compact object. Um, okay, just give me a second. Okay, let's start the construction. Um, so, Mm, yes. So let's start with Einstein's Virvan field theory. Um, so basically, you know, in gravity, there are two symmetries to consider, Poincaré group and uh, diffeomorphisms and diffeomorphisms. <laughs> uh, so we can separate these symmetries uh, if we consider a principal bundle with some uh, base manifold M and structure to group G. So in this sense, uh, the coordinates x mu only transform under the systems, but not under the local Poincaré group. And uh, the systems relabel the points on the base manifold, while uh, local Poincaré group transformation is a transformation along the fiber. So basically, you can imagine that you uh, you have this manifold, and then you have some fiber, and then uh, basically. Uh, the particle will be like in the fiber, defined in the fiber. Uh, and basically we can see how uh, the field transform under infinitesimal diffeomorphism in equation say six, uh, which is what we usually expect. Um, so in order to start this formulation, uh, we can gauge the Poincaré group um, as we, uh, so before we then the coset is um, is the parametrization of equation 37. This parameterizes only um, uh, local translations, and so basically uh, now we can introduce the motor carton form uh, and introduce the the gauge fields for translations and the gauge field for Lorentz transformations. And so we have a covariant, um, covariant uh, Carton form that follows equation 38 
And as I have been mentioning before, it can be written down in a linear combination of the generator uh, where um, we have, I mean, so we start with some kind of verifying and then redefine it again, uh, such as in equation 39. So actually in equation 39, that's like the usual verifying that you find in uh, item verifying field theory, which relates the metric um, of space curve, uh, space um, of curve space time uh, with a flat uh, flat metric to the verifying. Um, <clears throat> and so it has some transformation properties. We can see that on their local translations, equation 40. Um, Basically, the Virbine transforms as uh, inhomogeneous shift, and then uh, the the other term omega, uh, the other field transforms. Basically, um, it's just ontology. And so then we can uh, find the transformation properties under Lorentz transformation, and in equation 42, we can find that. Uh, the Virbine transform linearly under the Lorentz transformation. And then the other field omega transforms uh, as, a, as a connection. So actually this is the spin connection. It is known, uh, omega mu AB is known as a spin connection um, in the einstein virbine uh, field theory. <clears throat> and so finally, this is how the Virban and spin connection transform on their diffeomorphism. system. Um, and we can see basically in equation 45 that both fields transform in the same way. Um, okay, so as, as previously introduced, we can define a covariant derivative <laughs> using the uh, coefficients that appear in front of the unbroken Lorentz generators. Um, yes. Yeah. Is, that is just equation 46. <clears throat> and basically with this, um, the covariant derivatives and the verbine for this case are the only necessary ingredient to describe nonlinear realization of translations and the local action of the Poincare group. And so <clears throat> um, the most general action will take the form of equation 47. And so basically you can just um, add all invariant operators, if operators that you want, they just uh, you just need to contract them in a Lorentz invariant fashion. Uh, the curvature invariance can be obtained as usual from the commutator of two covariant derivatives, uh, which uh, acting on a vector field, um, which is related to the Riemann tensor and the torsion tensor. Then basically. Um, I mean, these quantities trans can transform, can yeah, transform independently. So uh, you can build up the general Lagrangian of equation 50, um, uh, 50, and then if you enforce um, the torsion tensor to be zero and only um, want the say low energy dynamics gravity, where the uh, say Freeman, uh, no, Richie scholar is predominant, then you end up with equation 51, that is the um, gravitational action in the weird band formalism. That is basically just like the einstein hubert action, but instead of having the determinant of G, you have the metric, you have the um, determinant of the very band. Um, yes, and so with this same constraint of torsion tensor to be zero, then we, we can find a spin connection uh, in terms of the Virbein field that is the well-known spin connection for gravity in the Virbein formalism. Um, okay, so that was all for gravity and now we can like build up uh, point particles. So as, as again, we're interested in the symmetry breaking pattern, uh, but so, a free point particle coupled to gravity, which is a limit of a uh, brain. So actually, um, I, I'm not that sure if this was developed like for brains and then like used for point particles. But so um, 
many people have worked with brains and then you can get point particles in a very particular limit in which is one dimensional and oriented in the time like direction and this has um, um, some very specific symmetry breaking patterns so we have unbroken generators that are time translation and spatial rotation and we have broken generators so that we we now broke uh, spatial translations and we are breaking boost. Uh, oops, then the, oops. Uh, yes, then um, we can parameterize the cassette as in equation uh, 54. So um, in difference with uh, gravity, now we have another factor that contains uh, basically boost. Uh, and now we like they depend on the affine parameter lambda that traces out the word line of the particle. So using this parameterization, we like we can compute the matter Cartan form. Uh, for instance, uh, let's first consider without the covariant form. So you have just partial derivative, and so basically you just you know like um, do the algebra basically and follow each step until you find a linear combination of the elements. In this, in this slide, I have expressed like step-by-step, step, um, uh, you know, derivation of the linear combination. Uh, and basically you can find at some point um, the, the Lorentz matrices. Um, so, yeah, but so this was like without gravity, um, just, to give like uh, an overall view of how this is computed. Now let's add gravity. So we have the, the covariant Murray Cartan form, but all, not only that, the relevant low energy dynamics or building blocks are contained in the projected form. That is just like the Murray Cartan form, but then you have some X dot mu in front, which is the same. And so uh, basically, we will find again that we can write it in a linear combination just as before, uh, but then our building blocks have changed a little bit. Um, but so, yeah, so basically uh, those are our building blocks. Those are the explicit form of them. And um, so basically now we can impose the Higgs constraint. Um, and so with the Higgs constraint, some of the fields can be removed, like the eta field uh, that it corresponds like to good. Um, yes. And so this can be done like the inverse Higgs constraint, given that the uh, commutator of the of good with uh, uh, time translations gives you uh, spatial translations. And basically this implies the existence of, of the constraint. And so um, we can set now the constant derivatives equal to zero, just as equation uh, 68. Um, and basically this can be rewritten, this constraint that makes uh, manifest its physical interpretation. So, um, so basically we obtain a set of local Lorentz vectors that define an also normal local basis with respect to flat space time uh, in the moving frame. Uh, yes, so we obtain a set of bare binds that define the local inertia frame. Uh, furthermore, um, it can be shown that the covariant derivative of, of, of the Goldstone eta um, is proportional to acceleration. Uh, so that means that to lower order, this is going to be zero. Um, furthermore, we, so let, okay, so we can start like playing around with the building block now that we have said all this. And so we can define first our building block E as well, like the absolute value of it such that uh, we can write as an equation 22. And if we impose the inverse Higgs constraint that we just saw, then we find a relation, uh, equation 73, that is uh, the building block E 
it's related to the Bottomer tau and lambda. And so basically this is very helpful because um, when we want to derive an action uh, to, all, to lowest order, say in the absence of gravity, so the acceleration is equal to zero, then the, we, we have seen that uh, the covariant derivative of, of eta is, uh, is proportional to acceleration, so, so that's equal to zero. The Higgs constraint tells you that the Cosset derivative of pi is equal to zero, and you don't have enough uh, like field context to be to build a covariant derivative of uh, of of the generator A of of the um, field A, and so the action only can take the simple form of the integral over uh, you know the affine the affine parameter times uh, W D block E, but this just leads to um, to the action for a point particle. So basically, we have seen that to lowest order, using the building block E gives us the point particle action. And what we, what can be said about the covariant derivative delta um, nabla eta is that it won't contribute to any order because uh, high order terms. Uh, are proportional to the lowest order term, and we have shown that the lowest order term is equal to zero. So equation 74 is is uh, the the full action, the full effective action for a point particle. Um, so there are some gravitational operators. We can use them to encode the finite size. Ex uh, yeah, the finite size extent of the object. This. Uh, just transform linearly under Lorentz transformation. So you actually need to define uh, the transformation of the Riemann tensor with just the Lorentz part of the parametrization G. And equation 76 is how they transform. Um, yes. So it's just also useful uh, to introduce the wild tensor, uh, which is made up basically of the Riemann tensor, and it just transforms in the same way. So having said that, uh, we can add now spin to our object. Um, so basically we can break now the full point curve group. Um, so we break rotations. Um, usually um, this kind of objects like star, we have some uh, internal symmetry and this can be parametrized as a G, uh, group being the Poincare group time uh, as the internal geometry, the internal symmetry of the object. So basically this means that uh, our symmetry breaking pattern will be um, as the same as the point particle, but now you, you are breaking a rotation and you have some unbroken generators um, uh, bar J that contains some internal and space-time rotation. But, uh, okay, yeah, and for a spherical object, this bar J is just uh, like the unbroken linear combination of the internal and space-time rotation. Um, yes, where S, I, J are the generators of the internal SO3 group. But this particular parametrization of the cassette equation 80, 80 um, in which we have parametrized uh, translations with uh, Lorentz transformations, and then uh, you know, like parametrizing uh, rotations and boost. Well, like yes, unit uh, parametrizing Lorentz transformation as product of a rotation and a boost. Uh, this implies that there's the one-to-one -one correspondence between Gaussian fields and alpha and the fields eta uh, c um, given in equation 80. And so this parametration has like, it's very convenient because the residual uh, asymmetry uh, doesn't appear explicitly in your building blocks. So again, we proceed as before. Um, we have the current Moran carton form uh, projected onto the wall line of the objects, then you have some other building blocks. Um, 
and basically again we can use these building blocks to make a, an invariant quantity uh, furthermore uh, we will find a set of uh, so i think what is important here in is equation uh, 87 so it's it's very similar to the equation the, the constraint we find before hat n but here we have an additional set of rotation vectors uh, that uh, parameterizes the, the additional information of rotation. Um, so basically now, um, so as before we, we showed that uh, for boost, the derivative, the constant derivative of eta is equal to zero. So that actually tells us that um, equation 88 can be set to zero because it's dependent on the acceleration term. And basically the leading arch, the leading order action is equation 89. Um, yes, so, so where we have contracted uh, some quantity i with uh, four indices and, and two constant derivatives. So the linear term in the constant derivative doesn't appear be, um, due to term reversal symmetry. And the coefficients are, I uh, are related to the moment of inertia. Um, also, these coefficients for spherical objects uh, uh, basically can be made uh, some delta function such that the action reads like equ equation 90. Um, and then, basically, at this point, we just need to uh, compare this equation to uh, equation of relativistic spin point particles in equation 19.1. And we will find that uh, the constant derivative uh, nabla alpha ij basically is the angular velocity of the star. Um, and so we can find an explicit form of uh, this angular velocity that is equation 92. So, yeah, maybe I can just keep going. So this this um, this angular velocity transforms as in equation ninety five, and basically with this one we can just build up uh, an invariant action such as ninety seven. So this is the spin point particle action in the blob frame, and the The angular velocity, and so the gauge angular velocity is with the constraint uh, of that the the velocity um, the particle um, is equal to this lambda a zero component of the Lorentz transformation, and so with this uh, doing some algebra, you can derive equation ninety eight, which is a uh, like the analog of the spin supplementary condition. Um, and to lowest order, this equation is equal to zero. Uh, yes. So you can add additional correction from the Wiltonian point of view. And basically, it's going to be fast. Uh, we can add all um, possibilities. So for instance, this is a general action for spinning object equation. 101. So the first two terms, the relativistic uh, uh, action for a point particle. Then you have some corrections uh, due to spin, uh, spin corrections due to gravity. Then you have some, uh, what you see? the fourth term is a uh, finite size effect. And then the fifth term is just dissipative effect. And so, um, well, we can ensure that our theory will be valid by expanding over some small ratio parameter. Um, yes. So basically, this theory is for slowly spinning compact objects, but like there are no maximally spinning objects outside in 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 space. So actually, all um, all all stars are like slowly spinning. So this model can fit very well for any compact object. Um, so yeah, to summary, we have formulated general relativity as a gauge theory. Uh, 
with associated with local Poincare symmetry, and then translations are linearly non linearly realized. Um, we have described uh, spinning complex objects coupled to gravity, uh, objects which breaks break uh, breaks the ground state space time symmetry. Um, Yes, basically the action we have obtained is a generalization of a non-relativistic rigid body. Um, yeah, basically that's all. It has some advantages uh, over the other previous formulations such that it doesn't uh, introduce additional or redundant, redundant uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, also other formulations, the gauge condition needs to be solved at each order, at every order in the derivative expansion. In this formulation, uh, the redundant degrees of freedom and are eliminated once and for all using the inverse Higgs constraint. Um, and so another thing that I wanted to say is that um, on the PN expansion, just by taking the 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 form of the angular velocity that we obtain, uh, we can uh, uh, express the minimal coupling equation one and two in, in that form. And that form is like the starting step of computing the Poisson expansion for spinning objects. So usually to do that, like people just um, they have to introduce additional degrees of freedom. And then like, I don't know, I found it quite obscure to be honest. Like I didn't like how I was uh, like, like learning uh, spinning objects with the other formulation. And then like you build up this quantity and then obtain these building blocks and then like plug in things and suddenly you are there. Like, like you are ready to compute the potential expansion. So I find this another advantage of uh, using this formalism and uh, basically that's all I wanted to say for today. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? So I have a question. Where where do you see the program going? What did you like to solve? What do I like to solve now? Um, no, what would you like to solve long term? Uh, to solve with this. Um, I mean, so um, okay. First of all, like uh, I mean. So you can compute the post neutron expansion of this very specific theory. Uh, and, and you will find basically a leading order the same result of all other known theories. Um, but what I also find interesting is that you can also add um, like more fields into it, especially, so just recently it was um, uh, someone introduced uh, you know, the electromagnetic field into this uh, effective field theory for extended objects. And then basically, I think like we can just add this field into the um, Mario Carton form and work the details and find, um, you know, like derive the most general action. I think that would be the most general action for a compact object um, to find within your relativity. Cool. Good. Any other questions? No, not from me. Okay. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, then thank you very much, Irvin. And next week we have uh, I think we have David Tong speaking next week. So um, please do show up again next week. And um, otherwise I will see everybody 
uh, well, most of you, um, tomorrow for a group meeting. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Yes.